Hello, my name is DJ Edwardson. I'm a science fiction and fantasy author, and I recently gave some talks about my thoughts on literature and the arts, but the audio did not turn out so great. So I'm going to go through what I talked about again here and share with you the slides that I used for that talk. I hope you find it helpful. So this talk is entitled the art of faith and it's about reading uh, and it's about art in general and it's about the recovery of their proper place in the Christian world and in Christian life and in the world in general you may be listening to this and you think well maybe I'm not an artist what does this have to do with me but think of it like a treasure hunt if you want to find treasure, if you want to be a discerning reader, if you want to be someone who's thinking about the bigger picture, about culture and where things are headed and where we've been, understanding the place of art and literature in the world and in, in the Christian faith is going to be fundamental for you if you're really going to find meaning and truth and beauty. Okay, so first, I'd like to talk about Ziggy Zeitgeist. And this comes from an article that was in the Wall Street Journal. And it's written by, I think, Henry Allen is the author's name. I don't know much about him, but this is giving you his insights or his perspective on on what's happening uh, in the world today. For the first time in my 72 years, I have no idea what's going on. I used to be Ziggy Zeitgeist, Harry Hip. I like to think I was especially good on the feeling tone of the world around me. Now I'm disquieted. It's not that I see things changing for better or worse, for richer or poor, or even not changing at all. It's something else. The most important thing in our culture sphere isn't change, but the fact that reality itself is dwindling, fading like sun-struck wallpaper, turning into a silence of the dinner party sort that leads to a default discussion of movies. We've lost our sense of possibility. Incomes decline. Pensions vanish. Love dwindles into hooking up. We're not having enough babies to replace ourselves. No arc, no through line, no destiny. As the British Tommies sang in the trenches of World War I to the tune of Old Lang Syne. We're here because we're here because we're here because we're here. I don't know what's going on. I doubt that anyone does. Is our democracy turning into a power vacuum? What will fill it? Will organized religion die? I got talking to a girl from an Episcopal youth group in Missouri. Episcopalianism is great, she said. You don't have to believe anything. Like most people, I used to think the world would go on in the way it was going on with better medicine and the arrival of an occasional iPad or an earthquake. That was when I knew what was going on. I worry that reality itself is fading like the Cheshire cat, leaving behind only a smile that grows ever more alarming. So that's where we're at, at least from uh, Ziggy Zeitgeist's perspective. And I think there's a lot to what he's saying there. And not only is this something that I feel like is a mood in the culture at large, in Western culture anyway. But I think to some degree, even in the church, there is a sense of lostness from the past, lostness from truths that we once knew, um, beauties that we once beheld. And much like in the Lord of the Rings movie, when the narrator comes in at the beginning of the film and says 
Much that once was is lost, for none now live who remember it. I think there is something vital that has been lost, and that few remember it, and even fewer who remember it cherish it. So we're wandering aimlessly in many senses, and this is about recovery, not just recovering the culture, but recovering a central aspect of holy life, of meaningful living, of God, his very character, and the nature of the church. And one of the best ways that we can recover what has been lost is through art, through literature. And I like to think of books as the collective memory of the culture, because books are written in stone. They don't change. The words don't change. Ideas and thoughts about those words may change. The value of those words may go up and down. But the words themselves, if we're willing to let them speak for themselves and not to try and you know reinterpret them or put our own stamp on them, we can recover through books what we may have lost. Now the church has many functions in society, and one of them is to be the conscience of the culture. It can be a corrective influence, and that's why this talk is not just about art, but really the role art can and should play in the life of the church. These days, the culture does not seem to really want to listen to its conscience. It uh, thinks, if I have a desire, that must be good, and the conscience is keeping me from that desire. It's, it's an obstacle. But I think many of us see the problem there, because once we start giving in to our whims, our desires, if we train ourselves as a culture to do that, then we will start defining good based on our desires. And we will condemn what we once held as true, and we will hold as important what we once condemned. And just apart from the sheer hypocrisy, living in a world where truth is in flux, where goodness is defined by the collective whim, means that we lose the ability to correct or even recognize our own moral failures. There can be no hope to restore the ailing patient which is society when the patient is constantly declaring his new disease to be the very height of moral progress. So if we are going to recover what was lost, if we're going to recover the truth, and if we're going to be able to communicate that truth to a world that so desperately needs it, we will have to go back. So a great place to begin is the beginning. And most of us probably know this verse from Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. One of the amazing things about this verse is that, like any good writer, God is introducing the main character right from the start. And in the beginning is, is sort of, to me, like once upon a time. And here we have God, and the very first thing that he does is create something, creates the heavens and the earth. So the verb, the very first verb used with God is create. He is a creator. And we all know that, but I don't think we often think of the implications of what that means, that God is a creative God. So in Ephesians 5, 2, it says, Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love, just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. So this is in the New Testament, much later, and it tells us there to be imitators of God. If we are Christians, if we're followers of God, if we're following and imitating God, shouldn't we be doing the kinds of things that God does? 
and here the verse is talking about you know loving and 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 really kind of good actions good works but even in describing the way this sacrifice um, is meant to be lived out the bible describes it in a poetic way as a fragrant aroma as something beautiful so even our good works can be beautiful and should have this um, wonderful quality about them so now that we have an idea of who god is who the main character of the story is let's look a little deeper into what that story is this is be a synopsis of the whole bible really um it starts with god and he creates the world and he immediately puts in a special way he creates mankind has a relationship with them he talks to them and he tells them that there is everything has been created for them it's it's good it's for them to enjoy except for the one uh, tree and he gives them this one law which they promptly break and that severs the connection that they have with their creator and sends the world into darkness and decay what we call the fall and from that point on the history of mankind is is sort of clawing his way through the centuries trying to get back to what he lost in the Garden of Eden. It takes many forms. Um, some of these men do it through violence. Some of them do it through dominating other people. Some of it do it. Some of them do it through idolizing human love. Some of them do it through um, money. But all of us are seeking our own good. And ultimately, our own good is never going to be good enough. It's always going to fall short of God's goodness and God's perfection. So we are wanderers in the desert. We are strangers in a strange land. And once there was a man who came from heaven to lead us back to paradise, to lead us back to union with God, to save us from the curse, which came as a result of Adam's sin upon all the human race. And this man was Jesus of Nazareth. And the interesting thing about him is that he said he was not just a man, but he was God in the flesh. The author of the story becomes a character in the story. And once that happens, it changes everything. It changes the very fabric and nature of the world that God created and of the story. It, it changes the arc of the story completely. And now it's not one of desperation and darkness and despair. It is one of hope and meaning and purpose and forgiveness and grace and mercy and truth. So the gospel says that to those who embrace Christ, who surrender and repent of their rebellion against God, there is forgiveness and there is new life and eternal life. That is the message of the gospel. And for those of us who have received the forgiveness of Christ, there is another aspect which is central to living out this new life that we have been given. And that can be summed up in the simple statement that Jesus is Lord. He is king, he is ruler. Absolute authority has been given to him over the lives of all believers. Now, ultimately, of course, he will be Lord of the lives of even those who reject him. But for those in this life who surrender to him, he will be the Lord of their lives. So how does that happen in the life of a Christian? 
Well, I think most of us would say that when we worship God, when we are in a religious setting, when we are praying, it's very easy for us to see the Lordship of Christ in that setting. Also, in our families, there are many scriptures which tell us and how to live as husband and wife, how to be parents and children and sons and daughters. So I don't think we typically, the church does not have much of a problem with surrendering to the Christ when it comes to the family. Even in work, I think most of us understand that we are not meant to dishonor the Lord in our workplace, that we should be honest, should have integrity, should, as, as much as we can, seek to be a light in, amongst our workplace. But once we get into things like music, it becomes a little more tense. We wonder if maybe this kind of music is not appropriate, um, not honoring to God, not bringing uh, glory. So this happens mostly in worship music, and it's been a divisive thing for some bodies of believers. And also we see a lot of uh, music, and I think rightfully so, as as rather worldly and and not terribly helpful in the Christian life. And I think because of the emotional nature of music, sometimes it does tend to be something that leads believers away from God. When it comes to the visual arts, and here I suppose we could include movies, um, there is even more uh, confusion and, and, and danger and, and, and abuse, frankly, because once we put something, an image of something on canvas or in a statue, I mean, we are creating a vision that may or may not uh, point us towards God, may not be something worth pondering. There are lots and lots of instances where the use of images has, has been a bad and negative thing. So can Jesus be Lord of the visual arts? And then for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to put special emphasis on books. What we read says a lot about what we think is important. Reading takes time. If you're going to spend hours poring over a book, is it something that is going to be edifying, going to be encouraging holiness, character, um, goodness? So is Jesus the Lord of the arts? In Colossians 3.17, the Bible says, Whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. I think that's pretty clear that everything would include the arts. It would include our creative activities. It would also include how we, as uh, audience members or consumers, uh, interact with art that has been created. It should be done in the name of the Lord Jesus. Abram Kuyper said, that there is not a square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, Mine. So if Jesus really is Lord, then we might need to rethink what that means when it comes to the arts. In Romans 1.20 it says, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Theologians like to divide the revelation of God, God's revealing of himself, into two main areas, and that is general revelation and special revelation. Special revelation is the particular uh, detailed revelation of God directly to humanity through his word. In the Bible, we un come to know and understand things that we would not know 
unless God told us when I was when my kids were little we explained it this way if I have a secret you can't know my secret unless I tell you and so in the Bible God reveals secrets about himself that we would not otherwise know he explains the significance of events but there's another kind of revelation called general revelation which is found just through living on the planet Earth, through experiencing nature, through seeing the world around us, through living in a family, and also painting a picture, reading a book. God reveals himself in both ways. Now, of course, the special direct revelation has more weight because it's more specific and the general can sometimes be a little more vague and confusing but there are two streams of revelation and we don't want to completely discount either of them so there are three dimensions of living out our lives under the lordship of Christ and these three have been kind of traditionally understood as the good, the true, and the beautiful. So goodness comes from God. It's not a standard apart from Him. It comes from His very character and nature. What God does is by definition good. He is goodness itself. And the true also defines God. He is truth itself. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. In the Numbers 23.19, God said, it says, God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said, and will he not do it? Or has he spoken, and will he not make it good? So we know that the Bible is true, that God's revelation of himself through nature tells us about himself, and that that message is entirely good. But we often don't really think of God as beautiful, or we certainly don't emphasize it very much. But beauty points to God. It embodies truth and goodness. It helps us see the goodness of God. It, it uses created things to point us towards that which is not visible and that which is eternal and timeless, good and true. In 1 Chronicles 16, 29, it reads, Give to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Now here we see that worship should be beautiful, that God's holiness is beautiful, that God cares about beauty. In Philippians 4, 8, we read, Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. So this is what we're supposed to put our minds on, what's good and what's true, but also what's lovely, what's beautiful. So don't limit yourself. Just to memorizing propositional truths, to studying to know more about God, to know more, to know more theology or facts or information. These things are incredibly useful, but there is something about beauty that tells us about God in a way that just reading nonfiction books or biographies or history all the time or just going to documentaries or um, spending our days in uh, you know practical I guess concerns things that are we can see a definite you know purpose for um, these things are all valuable they all have their place but our focus does not need to be just in the concrete and the didactic, and the propositional. 
And I think that's an area where the church has really, in some senses, lost its way. We don't understand beauty, or we're skeptical of it, or we don't see the value of it. When we look around, I sometimes wonder, where is the art today? Where are the great writers? Where are the great musicians, the great artists, architects? When I was in college, I spent a semester in Europe, and I was blown away when I got there. I just could not believe how beautiful the buildings were, how much art there was everywhere. Um, my favorite country was Italy, and it swept me off my feet in, in some ways. The beauty was just everywhere. Here in this slide, you see three of my favorite um, works of art, the Sistine Chapel on the left there, which is in Rome, and then Il Duomo, which is in Firenze, which is well, Florence, and um, and then the rose window, stained glass windows there from uh, Notre Dame in Paris. And as a, a young college student, I found myself wondering why were these things not created anymore? Why were things like this not in America for the most part? I I hadn't seen a lot of America at that point, but, but there just did not seem to be a great love for beauty. And so, so there are many reasons why this is so today. And I'm certainly not going to attempt to give any exhaustive explanation of why that's so. But one of the reasons is that, if you'll notice, all, all this artwork here is from the Christian church. It's from the Christian tradition, at least. And during the time of the height of the Renaissance and, and even on into the Enlightenment, when many of these works were created, even, um, even if it was non-Christian art, it was generally religious or myth, myth, had a mythological basis to it. So art was almost always religious in nature. And as the Western world began to change, um, through the Enlightenment and through the Renaissance, the understanding of religion and truth began to change, and and the art reflected that that new understanding. And part of this really came out of the church as well. And I like to really kind of focus in a little bit on that. So God is a creator. We've established that. So we know that God cares about art, but these things were meant to have a purpose. Art was not ever meant to just be art for art's sake, just create for the sake of creating. It had to have some sort of an end to it. And what happened with Israel and then even at the beginning of the church and on into the Middle Ages, there was an overemphasis, if you will, on these external things, these things that were supposed to point to God started becoming the focus rather than God himself. And in the medieval church, many people had come to see the worship of God as ritualistic, as hollow. And during the Reformation, there was a movement to kind of pull away from this in, in many areas, in many ways, in some instances it came down to actually demolishing works of art and and statues and things that were considered idolatrous and and frankly maybe some of them were um, but as often happens with revolutions and great movements in history they often went too far and there became a general skepticism towards external things and i think that continued on through the Puritans and into colonial America and, and through the Western world right up into, uh, you know, the 20th century, really. And so we have what uh, I am going to call the breaking of the fellowship. So if the fellowship is the good, the true, and the beautiful, then the good and the true became severed and separated from the beautiful. And now we had an emphasis on truth and goodness 
and a recovery of that, really, because the teachings in the medieval church had, had gotten away from special revelation, from God's revelation of himself, and, and had become really an idolizing of man and an idolizing of the traditions and whether or not those traditions had anything really to do with God, which they often did not. So now I'd like to move into the meat of my talk. <laughs> I guess that was just a really long introduction, which is a discussion of Francis Schaeffer's little uh, book, which has two essays in it, which is called Art and the Bible. Now, if I could sum up the thesis or the main point of this book in a single sentence, it would be this quote from the book, to worship art is wrong but to make art is not. Schaefer spends a lot of the first part of the book basically explaining that and defending that. And then the second part, he kind of shows how that works itself out in the life of the artist and the life of the church. So in the book, Schaefer asks this question, what is the place of art in the Christian life? And he unpacks this through looking at several passages in the Old Testament primarily and looking at the way God directed the creation of art and the way it was used and its purpose. And so let's look a, at a few of those passages just briefly. So in Exodus, we find this passage. And Moses said to the children of Israel, See, the Lord has called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And he has filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom and understanding and knowledge and all manner of workmanship, to design artistic works, to work in gold and silver and bronze, in cutting jewels for setting, in carving wood, and to work in all manner of artistic worksmanship. This is the first time in the Bible where someone is said to be filled with the Spirit of God. And isn't it interesting that as God's Spirit brooded over the waters um, in Genesis and, and, and created the world that we know, here God's Spirit is going into uh, Bezalel and causing him, inspiring him to make beautiful things for God. And in Exodus 25, it also says, And see to it that you make them according to the pattern which was shown you on the mountain. Here, the instruction is for the holy garments for, for Aaron, Moses' brother. And in Exodus 28, it also says that these are to be made for glory and for beauty. So these clothes are supposed to be glorifying to God and to be beautiful. One of the most important things that we learn from looking at the Old Testament is that art not only is supposed to be beautiful, and it's not only something that God commands and, and desires to be among his people and to be an expression of holiness, but art does not have to be representational. In talking about how to make the garments, God actually instructs that blue pomegranates be placed upon the robes. And in nature, there are no blue pomegranates. There are other colors of pomegranates, but not blue. So here God's saying, yeah, take something from nature, but use a little creative license. Change the color. It doesn't have to just be a photograph. He also instructs Solomon or through David to put gems in the temple for beauty, just for, not because they want to show off their wealth or um, because they have some sort of holy significance, but just for beauty. Of course, there are whole books of the Bible dedicated to um, poetry and music. And so if poetry and music were good enough to be <laughs> used to communicate the truth of God in his word, aren't they also worth using to communicate truth today? Are sermons and 
biographies and radio shows, are they the only ways to communicate God's truth? Of course not. But it does seem like the church often acts that way. But as Schaefer tells us, an artwork can be a doxology in itself. Art can and should glorify God. So in the second part of his book, he gives us a Christian perspective on art. And he tells us um, that art is valuable just in and of itself. It's meant to be enjoyed. It doesn't have to have a quote-unquote practical, uh, identifiable purpose. Just the celebration of beauty and the creativity of God um, through the artist is something worthy in and of itself. However, it doesn't mean that all art is the same. Art has a worldview. It's communicating something about the world or the way the artist sees the world or how we should see the world. And that's called a worldview. And art always strengthens the particular worldview that it embodies. But to be effective, to really be good art, and really be art at all, it has to make sense. It can't be completely abstract because then it just it just distances itself from the viewer, from the reader. So art has to make sense. Not all art has to be accepted. Just because an artist creates something does not mean it's worthy of our time and uh, affections and attention. And then he goes into a more detailed description of ways we can evaluate art. So first of all, he makes this interesting point. When we're judging an artist's work, we don't want to just look at one particular piece and, and draw all the conclusions from, you know, this is what this piece is saying, because that piece is part of a larger body of work. And so when we're examining the, the weight, the value of, of an artist, we want to be sure to look at the entire body of work. So there are four main ways we can judge an artist's work. We can look at technical excellence, how skilled is the artist. We can look at validity, and this means does it have a genuine expression of the artist? Was the artist just doing it for um, money or for some outside influence. This isn't really what the artist uh, wanted to say. So art has to be valid in that sense. Also, we can judge the worldview. Does this communicate the truth? Is this a worldview that's consistent? Is, is it a worldview that is worth depicting in art? And finally, we can look at the synergy of form and substance does the style, does the form in which the art has been created, does that match well with the message? And he gives the example of T.S. Eliot, uh, The Wasteland, where he is trying to communicate something of the fragmented nature of the world at the time of uh, the early 20th century and how um, there was kind of a, a loss of meaning. And he commends... Eliot for, for writing in this non-metrical way, just sort of these fragments and, and bits and pieces, and it kind of reflected the message that he was trying to say. Another important point, which is a little bit of a side point, but it's worth noting, is that just because you're a Christian or just because you're a secular person does not mean that you will necessarily create a work of art from your worldview. So a non-Christian can create art that has an essentially Christian message, and a Christian can create art that has a non-Christian message. So in general, organically, the worldview will come through, but it's not necessarily the case all the time. So now that we understand you know, how to evaluate a work of art, Let's get back to the overall Christian perspective on art. So any type of art is valid. Fantasy 
is just as valid as history. Art can have truth, even though it's not propositional truth, and it's still there. And styles of art change, and this is not wrong. It's okay for us to recite poetry that's not in Old English. It's, it's fine. There's, we, we can't say, well, you know, the old hymn style is the preferred style. That's the only way we can communicate truth, or the best way even, to communicate truth. There was a time when the old style was the new style, and people might have had a problem with it back then. I'm not saying that all styles are equally beautiful, but just because something is old does not necessarily mean it's better. And this is kind of a corollary point, but there's no such thing as a godly style. If you try to say, well, what is Christian music? You, you really can't come up with a definition that, you know, that's Christian music. I mean, you, you, you could, but it's not going to be terribly useful, and you're probably always going to find places where that rule breaks. And finally, and this was the part that I just found so helpful, is that Christian art may be divided into a major and a minor theme. So what does this mean? So the minor theme is the brokenness of a fallen world. It involves several aspects, including the lostness of man. So this is what I talked about earlier when I went through the gospel. We have lost our way as a race, and we have heartbreak and sorrow, and we are fragmented and not whole. But the brokenness also can be seen even in those who are following Christ, in the struggles of living a godly life and um, maintaining a strong walk before the Lord. The major theme is the meaning and purpose of life. So if the minor theme is, is the bad news, the major theme is the good news. So there's two main aspects here. A metaphysical aspect, which tells us that God exists and that life is not absurd and man is significant. So this is kind of the opposite, the other side of the coin from the minor theme. This tells us that all of those books and poets and philosophers and scientists uh, who are telling us that there's no meaning, there's no purpose. No, there is purpose. There is meaning. God exists. And also, the second aspect is that there is morality. There is objective goodness, and there is objective goodness, and its source is God, which is unchanging. So morality is also unchanging. What's good to do today is also good tomorrow and will be now and forevermore. It also shows us that man is fallen, but he may be redeemed. We don't have to always bear those burdens of sin on our back that Christ has borne them for us. So if I could sum up the two themes, really, the minor theme is the fall of man, and the major theme is the redemption of man by God. And this redemption, this mercy on the part of God, is also a cause for great hope. So if that's a perspective uh, on Christian art, what are some wrong ways to approach Christian art? One would be overemphasizing the minor theme. This leads to unbiblical art. We just get to look at the sin and the degradation and the hopelessness and Frankly, this is what often happens in movies, uh, in a lot of bestsellers and um, popular art today. We see the rise of anti-heroes and just this jaded uh, hopelessness. But on the other hand, overemphasizing the major theme usually leads to a sort of sentimentality. It, it just appears dishonest. It doesn't appear genuine. It doesn't appear real. It doesn't appear authentic. And this, frankly, happens probably more in what would be called Christian art, even though 
I, I wouldn't use that definition, but it's what's popularly branded as Christian art. We see that just, you know, say this prayer and everything turns out right, or, you know, you, you've, you've struggled with this terrible past, but now, you know, the person is saved and everything is made right. So yeah, there is this tendency to sort of think of Christian art as what um, the market defines as Christian art and tells us as Christian art. And that is not necessarily what the Bible and what God would consider Christian art. Christian art does not have to be evangelical, overtly evangelical. It does not have to lead someone to Christ. You do not have to quote the Bible. You do not have to have a Christ figure in your story. Remember what we said at the beginning. Jesus is Lord over all of life, over all of humanity, over all of our nature. And if we just try to say that we can only see him in the gospel, we can only see him in a Bible verse on a pillow, then we aren't really saying he is big enough to be Lord over all these other areas of our life. And we're creating a secular, sacred divide where there really isn't one in the Bible. And this is a quote from John Foreman, who is a singer with the band Switchfoot, I believe. And he says this, Does Lewis or Tolkien mention Christ in any of their fictional series? Are Bach's sonatas Christian? What is more Christ-like? Feeding the poor? Making furniture? Cleaning bathrooms? Or painting a sunset? There is a schism between the sacred and the secular in all our modern minds. The view that a pastor is more Christian than a girl's volleyball coach is flawed and heretical. The stance that a worship leader is more spiritual than a janitor is condescending and flawed. These different callings and purposes further demonstrate God's sovereignty. Many songs are worthy of being written. Switchfoot will write some. Keith Green, Bach, and perhaps yourself will have written others. Some of these songs are about redemption, others about the sunrise, others about nothing in particular, written for the simple joy of music. So art does not have to be overtly religious. It can be something that is just bringing glory to God through beauty. So one of the reasons that we know this is because God doesn't create that way. God does not create Christian sunsets and non-Christian sunsets, Christian mountains and non-Christian mountains, Christian waterfalls and non-Christian waterfalls. We can look at a field of flowers and see the glory of God. There is no scripture written on those flowers. We some A scripture may come to mind, and a scripture may come to mind when you're looking at a statue or a painting. And we can certainly include scripture in a book. There's nothing wrong with being overtly Christian either. It just doesn't have to be that way for it to be called Christian art. And man is a valid subject because he is made in the image of God. He is a worthy subject for art. You can make a play about the life of a waiter or uh, a dentist or love songs, and they can remind us of the love of God, of the goodness of God. There is an entire book in the Bible, the Song of Solomon, which does that. So why can't a song or a book or a poem? It's important to remember that Christ is the Lord of the whole man, as we said. So Christian art does not need to be a tract. It does not have to walk you through four points and lead you to some application. It can be beautiful for God, and that's enough. In the Psalms, which are full of poetry and beauty and imagery, we read, One thing I have desired of the Lord, that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. That was one of the motivations for the psalmist to go worship, was to behold the beauty of the Lord. And certainly, the worship of God should be the most beautiful aspect of our lives. But 
that beauty does not have to end when you walk out of the church doors or when you stop praying. God's creation and God's beauty is meant to be enjoyed at all times. In Matthew 5.16, we read, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. And I looked up the word works in Greek, and one of the possible meanings is indeed things that you've created, things that you have made. So if our good deeds and our actions should bring glory to God, why not our artwork? This is what Ziggy Zeitgeist needs. This is what is pleasing to the Lord, to glorify your Father which is in heaven through your good works, through your service to others, and through your creativity. To see the truth proclaimed from the pulpit and embodied in works of beauty that point to the goodness and truth of our Creator. And towards the end of his book, Schaefer says these wonderful words, Christian artists do not need to be threatened by fantasy and imagination, for they have a basis for knowing the difference between them and the real world out there. The Christian is the really free person. He is free to have imagination. This too is our heritage. The Christian is the one whose imagination should fly beyond the stars. Amen. And I'll leave you with this quote. The Christian life itself should be our greatest work of art. Whether you're an artist or not, your life is a story. It may not get written down, but there is an author who is reading your life and sees you like an open book. Is that story honoring to God? Is it communicating his goodness, his truth, and his beauty? The world is desperately looking for meaning. It's looking for restoration, for a return to the beauty of the Garden of Eden and paradise and forgiveness and freedom from sin and justice. That can be found nowhere else outside of God. So let's create and seek out great works of art that show the beauty of the holiness of God and to God be the glory.